Let's think about Let's think now about the management of hypovolemic shock. And first I want to look at hypovolemic shock caused by hemorrhage, and secondly, hypovolemic shock caused by dehydration. So first of all, thinking about hypovolemic shock caused by hemorrhage. Well, obviously, we want to stop the bleeding, arrest the hemorrhage. And in the first aid situation, we do this by applying firm, direct pressure over the wound, as long as we're happy that there's no penetrating foreign body in it. Direct pressure can massively reduce the amount of blood which is lost in a first aid situation. Then in the hospital situation, we might identify specific bleeding vessels, clip those off and ligate them. In other situations, the bleeding might be internal. And in that case, the patient is going to need emergency preoperative care and a surgeon to open a body cavity and clip off bleeding vessels within a body cavity. We can also immobilise fractures. If we immobilise fractures, that will also reduce the amount of bleeding from the fractured ends, particularly of long bones, where the blood loss can be extensive. And then the patient's going to need intravenous fluids. So as we've said, we want two large bore cannulas inserted, probably one into each arm. And the fluid we're going to need to give in the initial resuscitation, in the initial fluid resuscitation phase, is a crystalloid fluid. Probably a Hartmann's, which is a Ringer's lactate type of solution, or a normal saline. But we give a crystalloid type of fluid. And we need to give quite a lot because we want to completely rehydrate the patient. And the rule of thumb here is that for every 100 mils of blood the patient has lost, we want to give them 300 mils of crystalloid fluid replacement. The rhyme is, for every big bleed, 341 you will need. So for every mil of blood that's lost, we need to give 3 mils of fluid replacement. And in the initial situation, we use crystalloid fluids because these can move freely between the vascular and the interstitial compartment and will restore all of the patient's body fluids. And it's also very important to warm them to body temperature before we give large volumes of fluid. Because if we don't warm the fluid, we can reduce the patient's core temperature by infusing large volumes of cold intravenous fluid. Now, why is it so important that the patient does not become hypothermic? Well, if a patient's hypothermic, that's going to inhibit the enzymes which are responsible for blood coagulation. Because enzymes work within very specific temperature ranges. And as the body temperature starts to drop, the efficiency of these enzymic systems will be reduced. That means the blood will not coagulate properly. So hypothermic patients have a coagulopathy. Certainly by the time the body temperature gets down to 35 degrees centigrade, clotting can be significantly impaired. So do not let bleeding patients become hypothermic. Keep them warm. We don't want to make them hot so they vasodilate, but we certainly do not want them to be hypothermic. So warm intravenous fluids. Now, if a particular part of the body is bleeding, and we make that, we call that part of the body, that can actually cause a peripheral vasoconstriction, which can reduce local bleeding. But it's very important that we don't allow the patients to become hypothermic because the blood will not clot properly and they'll bleed more. That means we can actually do harm by giving cold intravenous fluids. And of course, we must never do the patient any harm. And we need to assess the response of the patient to the fluid that we're giving. So the rule of thumb is 341, but we need to assess the individual response. So if the fluids are going in and the patient's heart rate is reducing, their colour is better, their blood pressure is improving, their level of consciousness improving, is improving, this indicates that the fluids are having the desired effect. And urine output is a very good indicator of how well perfused the body is. So if we're giving fluids and the patient is still not producing urine, it may be that we're not giving enough. 
if we're giving fluids but the patient is responding, urine outputs are going up, that is a very good clinical indicator. Now let's think about dehydration now. If a patient's dehydrated, for example, as a result of gastroenteritis, we want to give them oral rehydration salts, oral rehydration solutions. And also we want to treat the underlying cause. So sometimes we might give the patients antibiotics. And dehydration, hypovolemia caused by dehydration, secondary to gastroenteritis, as a result of diarrhea and vomiting, is still one of the leading causes of death in the world's children. So next I want to look specifically at how we're going to treat dehydration caused by diarrhea and vomiting in children.